All right. Um, thank you all for being here. This is uh, really an honor. I'm just happy to be invited to speak about um, how, to, how do we approach treating people who develop metastasis. Um, so I'd like to thank the Acure Insight team. Had a great time at the 5K event a few months ago, and I'm excited to see many of the same faces here today. Um, so I'm a medical oncologist at the University of Washington and Fred Hutch, and uh, a big part of my practice is the care of patients with ocular melanoma, both in surveillance and then also treatment for patients who develop metastasis. I don't have any relevant uh, disclosures for this talk. I, 20 minutes is a little bit of a short time to give a talk about how we do this. So I actually took a little different approach to what I might typically do. So I wanted to talk a little bit, and this will build upon the last session of you know, what does this point in the journey look like where we find a suspicious area and what we do, and that's already been covered, so we'll go through that um, perhaps a little quicker. Um, talk at a big level about what are the tools that we use to treat this problem, and how does an oncologist as a t part of the team think about deploying the tools for a different situation in a different patient? Because what I heard a lot in the last session and what I would continue to think is quite relevant is that this is not a one-size-fits-all solution. The answer that's the best treatment plan for one patient could be really different for somebody else. And so um, there's a lot we can learn from each other, but also there's a lot of heterogeneity in the different cir circumstances that patients find themselves in. And so it's, I'll actually focus on like, what are the things your oncologist is thinking about as you're trying to sort through which option is the right for, for you? And then I think, you know, this is, in a, you know, after many years of not having treatments approved for this specific disease, um, the last couple years have brought some changes. And so I thought just briefly touch on a couple recently approved dr uh, drugs and treatments for ocular melanoma. Um, it really is a, is a hopeful, I think, that we are now seeing more and more research being done for this disease, and we'll have more and more treatments coming online soon, hopefully, and better and better treatments as Dr. Bhatia said. So um, I think for this audience, this is probably known, but I think um, we're really talking about when we talk about metastatic disease, um, the diagnosis is the vast majority of the time made in the eye first. And at that time, many patients undergo a CT scan or some type of scan of the rest of the body. And the vast majority of the time it's normal or there's no evidence of spread of the tumor. And so patients go on to get their treatment to their eye tumor, uh, many different types that's already been covered. And then at some time later on in the future, recurrence is discovered some other place in the body, and that, that's what we call metastasis. So that will be the focus of today's talk. How, do we, how does this happen? I think we've heard a couple comments about this, that with our current practices of doing MRI scans, most of the time people feel fine and there's a small spot on the MRI. That's the most common scenario. And people who aren't getting surveillance or in the era before we did surveillance in the way that we did, symptoms often led to the diagnosis of metastatic disease. And those symptoms usually are symptoms of involvement of the liver by cancer. Symptoms like pain, nausea, vomiting, weight loss, jaundice, symptoms of liver issues. Um, but this is now the much less common way the bottom is much more common. Patients are, obviously, are usually feeling fine, and then their scan shows some new finding that's often very small, often too small to fully characterize initially, and often requires a little more time for us to understand what's going on, but usually feeling in their normal state of health. And so this has shifted. Um, this is a graphical depiction of this. So if we think about the metastatic burden, or kind of broadly, the amount of cancer that's present in the body. Um, on the left-hand side of this, we, we can detect things earlier and earlier now with MRI scans. We can see areas of the liver that are abnormal, that are the radiologists will literally call them punctate, meaning pinpoint. They can't even measure it at a millimeter. It's smaller than that. And, and many of those things end up not being metastasis. But we have this time where we can detect cancer recurrence before there are symptoms. And this time in some patients can be a really long time before the cancer is destined to grow large enough to cause symptoms. And so I just think this is worth a comment because if we think about historically, you know, many people have heard numbers like the survival after metastasis may only be three to six months. 
but we'll look at a slide in a second. It's longer than that now, but I think a large part of that increase is actually that we're detecting things earlier at a pre-symptomatic state. And so it's important for that to keep in mind that many patients will be diagnosed with metastasis, which is a life-threatening and in many patients, life-limiting problem, but often not imminently life-limiting. It's a high risk in the future, but at the time of diagnosis, often not. And that's different than it was in the past. So I pull this up because this is one of our largest recent trials um, showing the survival of patients with metastatic ocular melanoma. This is the study that led to the approval of Dibentifus or Kimtrak. And you can see on average, the median or kind of the 50th percentile of survival in this study of metastatic patients, you had to be metastatic to start, was 22 months in the Tibentifus, where almost two years was the 50th percentile. Half of people lived longer than that. And so that's a lot longer than the three to six months that's, you know, some of the publications from 10, 15, 20 years ago used to say. And I think that the medicines have contributed somewhat, but we also are doing things a lot differently in how we monitor and detect the recurrences now than we were 15 to 20 years ago. So for someone who's being seen in my clinic now, they, they actually, even if you're diagnosed with metastasis, may have a reasonable expectation of living one or many years, which is, again, different than the historic paradigm. So this is an example of some of the ditzels, or the little tiny abnormalities that we might see. This is an MRI of the abdomen. This arrow is pointing at a tiny bright spot amongst the liver. This is less than a centimeter in size. This was determined to be uh, metastatic ocular melanoma, but this is, represents a grain of sand in an otherwise normal and healthy liver. Uh, and so this patient would likely go on to live for probably multiple more years before developing symptoms of the cancer, but now it's known that there's metastasis. Um, and so this is just an example to really build upon what was talked about in the last session of this. We call it lead time. This lead time between when we know there's a problem and it's causing an imminent and life-threatening problem. So um, this is, I think, actually going to be the, the slide I'm probably going to spend the most time on and hopefully is the most informative. Um, this is the things that I'm thinking about in my clinic when I see someone who has metastatic ocular melanoma. Can we do a biopsy? We just heard that in the question and answer. Really important for the reasons Dr. Bhatia said. I won't belabor that. I completely agree with him. What is the burden? Is there a tiny sub-centimeter spot in the liver and that's it? Are there symptoms? Is this someone who has a lot of cancer and is having cancer-related symptoms? Those are really different scenarios. They have really different prognostic implications. And the way in which we think we might deploy our therapies available could be very different for those two scenarios. So how much cancer is there? Where is it in the body? Is this confined to the liver alone? Is, are there, is there evidence of cancer outside the liver, in the lungs, bones, lymph nodes, somewhere else? What's the rate of growth? In people who have been doing surveillance, we often know, you know, this is how it looked six months or 12 months ago, and this is how it looks now. So this is something that's known in people who are on surveillance, and it kind of predicts what might happen in the next several months afterward. Typically, the past behavior of the cancer kind of is somewhat predictive of the future behavior. And so what is, how fast are things changing, which informs the question of how urgent is it that we do something about this right now? Or do we have a little time to really explore all of our options very thoroughly? Something new and totally unique to ocular melanoma is what's, what's the patient's HLA status? So this is not relevant for any other solid tumor, um, but tibentifusp is used specifically for people with a certain inherited immune barcode, and this is not something that most people have ever been tested for, um, certainly not something that most primary care doctors could order or think of, and even most oncologists who don't do bone marrow transplant don't routinely order this test. And now melanoma doctors are ordering it too. Uh, but this is a very unique aspect to ocular melanoma care, which really isn't relevant 
uh, in any other cancer. Uh, but this is an important thing that I'd like to know in clinic, or if we don't know, we'll find out. Are there major comorbidities? Uh, is there a concern I have about deploying a treatment because it could be more toxic in this patient than in someone else? So an example of that would be people who have autoimmune diseases and some of our other types of immunotherapy that stimulate the immune system. That could create a dangerous scenario. And so that's an example where the treatment for person A might be not the best treatment for person B. And then I think the last item is, should we consider something that's not on the standard menu of options? It really is something that's experimental, uh, like a clinical trial. I'm a big believer in clinical trials. I help run them at our cancer center. That's how we've led to both of the two recent uh, treatments that have been approved for ocular melanoma. Um, so I, I think it's how we get better treatments, and I strongly encourage people to consider it. But it's fundamentally a very personal decision. You know, how comfortable are you going on to a study of something that is in the process of being evaluated. And that's, that's really, uh, some people are more comfortable with that than others. And I think personal preference is really important, but is this something that could be an option or that you would consider doing? All right, so why do we treat patients with ocular melanoma? This may be, I think it's Maybe explain, people say this is a silly question, but I think it's important to clarify in the clinic when you're embarking on a treatment plan. Um, some common goals that are shared during clinic visits are to live longer. I'd like to prevent the cancer from growing, uh, slow it down, prevent it from growing to allow me to live a longer life. Um, to improve symptoms that the cancer might be causing or to delay the time until that happens in the future, to, to preserve quality of life or prolong quality life in addition to just days alive. And the mix of this, or there may be other reasons that other individuals have, can be really different. And this is yet another variable that feeds into why the best, tre the best treatment plan for two different patients could be very different from each other, even with the same disease. So, in the toolkit, Largely, I've listed most of the main options here. There may be something I forgot, but I hope not. So systemic medical therapies are things that medical oncologists give. Um, these are pill drugs or intravenous drugs that distribute throughout the body and have an, an impact on the cancer, uh, either directly or by impacting something like the immune system. Liver-directed therapy has become a really long list of different treatments. I am not a radiologist who does this, but we do work closely with radiologists. And this is basically a type of treatment where a, a drug or treatment is administered directly to the liver. And as we heard in the last session, um, liver issues, liver metastasis, and liver failure is a common uh, problem and a common way that the ocular melanoma metastases become life-threatening. And so this disease has been, there's been a number of approaches to try to treat the liver specifically to prevent her, that from happening or prolong the time until that happens. So this can involve using immune stimulating medicines, radi radioactive beads, chemotherapy drugs, just cutting off the blood supply to liver tumors itself, or really isolating the liver entirely and giving high doses of medicine to the liver filtering it out and preventing uh, doses that the human body would not otherwise be able to tolerate, and then filtering the, the medicines out before they go back to the rest of the body, which is called percutaneous hepatic perfusion. So this is a really complicated area, but the broad picture is, can we treat the liver in some special way uh, targeted to the liver? Surgery and traditional radiation usually have a more limited role uh, maybe to address specific areas that are causing symptoms or problems, but they're often not one of our main modalities initially, unless there's a specific pain area or specific problem spot. And then I list here palliative care and supportive care because this is uh, really a part of the, the modality as well. Um, so how can we help patients feel as well as possible? And then for some patients, focusing on quality of life and symptoms might be the best, most appropriate option. Uh, depending on other medical issues they may have. And so I think that deserves to be on this list right alongside all of the other types of medical treatment. So uh, 
looking at the type of therapy for ocular melanoma, there's chemo, which are carefully dosed compounds to kill melanoma cells, targeted therapies, things that impact some unique vulnerability that the cancer cells have, uh, usually a specific target or mutation that the melanoma cells have, immunotherapies, which has now become a more complicated list, but broadly drugs that help the immune system recognize and fight the cancer, where the immune system is really the drug, the patient's own immune system. So how do you build a plan? You really have to know about the disease, about the patient, and the patient's preferences and goals, and then what's available or accessible wherever, you, you're, wherever you're being seen with your oncologist. Um, some things like clinical trials or some of these really advanced liver treatments may or may not be available near your home. So it's really a synthesis of these three things to help us try to build the right plan. This is really complicated, but an example is if you had some, a patient who is, the disease is exclusively in the liver, you might be thinking about bringing in one of those liver-directed treatments because that's really where the cancer is currently causing a problem. might be the only place we can detect cancer involvement. Whereas if most of the cancer was seen outside the liver, that probably wouldn't be as high on the list of treatments that we were considering. Uh, if patients are seen when they're not having any symptoms with relatively low burden of cancer, there may be time to evaluate clinical trials or different approaches. The whole discussion is getting more complicated in clinic than it was even a few years ago, and that's a good thing because we have more treatment options and more on the way and a lot more clinical trials to consider. And along with that, I think the fact that this is so complicated means that getting a second opinion can be really helpful. It might be that a different facility has a different approach or something that might be particularly uniquely suited to your situation. So I think... Um, as this becomes more specialized, the benefits of doing a second opinion increase. So, last, I know I'm two minutes late. Uh, very briefly, uh, just the two recent approvals specifically for ocular melanoma. These are treatments that have gone through studies specifically for this disease. Tibentafus, Chemtrac, show of hands, who's heard, who's heard the name? Okay, most people. So. It's been about 18 months now since this was approved, a little more. Importantly, this is restricted to patients with a specific HLA type, which is, I believe, the only medicine that is off the shelf that, is, that works this way and does this in, in cancer medicine. And so it's about half of patients of European ancestry, somewhat less common in other groups. And we, this requires specialized testing. There's no way from typical blood tests cholesterol panel, blood count, liver tests, that this is known. This requires a very specialized test. It works by engaging your immune cell, the T cell, with the melanoma cell through a very complicated mechanism. And this red, this red bar at the top, this protein, this is the HLA, which is different. It's the barcode protein that's different for everybody. And so this is why we have to do this really special test. Do you have the right lock and key to bring the immune system and the melanoma cell together with the help of Tibentafusp. And this is a little bit more about HLA, which I'll um, not belabor to finish shortly, but this is, um, they're basically like everyone's unique barcode. We inherit them from our parents. We have no control over what they are. If you have the right HLA type for ChemTrack, awesome. If you don't, it's not because you did anything wrong. Uh, we have no control over what they are. Uh, we, we talked about this earlier. Patients who have this, who got ChemTrack, had a significantly prolonged survival, which is really the, the ultimate bar of success for a medicine, is to show that people who receive this drug live longer. And that, that's what this study showed. Dr. Hall, just while we're on this slide, can I ask a quick question about yeah. this? Um, does this show patients who have metastatic disease to the liver? only, or is this a combination of people with systemic treatment or systemic spread, meaning liver and other locations, or is it only liver-directed or liver-focused you know, liver yeah. um, metastasis? My recollection is that you did not have to have liver metastases to be on this study. And this, and this graph is showing how long people lived, many of whom ended up finishing treatment with Tibentafus and going on to get other treatments, including maybe a liver-directed therapy. So it doesn't this, this tells a longer, a longer story than just what they got. But at the start of this study, 
This was the first treatment. It was tibentafusp, and then it was a list of other choices in the blue arm, uh, immunotherapies, chemotherapy, things like that. Okay, now that helps. Thank you. So less than a month ago, um, uh, a new treatment was approved. So this is a specific type of liver-directed therapy. The name for this is Hebzato, um, and this is a way to try to deliver chemotherapy to the liver specifically to treat liver metastases. Um, this data has been presented but has not been published in a very full manuscript, but um, what's been showed showed that about 30% of patients who were treated with this had significant shrinkage in liver metastasis. We don't yet have a lot of data about how long that, how that resulted in people overall lifespan, but um, yet again, another option that's come online literally with, since mid-August uh, for the treatment of this disease from a study that was focused on people with uveal melanoma, liver metastasis. So very exciting. And I look forward to seeing more about the formal results. So the treatment options are growing. We have gone from zero FDA-approved options to two in the last two years. Uh, and, and many others that we use that are not technically FDA-approved but can certainly help some patients. Um, the best treatment really is a clear intersection of the treatment options with the patient and what the patient values, their medical history, and what's feasible and, and kind of appropriate for their situation. Typically, for metastatic disease, we use systemic therapy with or without liver-directed therapy. Um, maybe more systemic, maybe more liver-directed, maybe even a synergy of the two. But those are our two main modalities for metastatic disease. We don't really know a lot yet about how to best sequence the treatments, how can we use different treatments together or in combination, and then how to make immunotherapy work more. We didn't talk about that, but that's what in other diseases has resulted in long-term survivors of metastatic cancer, is if we can really get the immune system engaged, that can be a long-lasting, continuing living drug, and there's a lot of work to do in uveal melanoma about how to do that best. So I'd like to thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, guys. Give him a hand. So we're going to have Lucy Innes coming up next, and she's actually going to chat with us about finding and treating metastases, or no, sorry, current and upcoming clinical trials. Um, and while those slides are getting pulled up, I just want to maybe draw a connection. If you guys were here for the earlier session, I think it was Dr... Chin, the radiologist, um, who I don't think he's here anymore, but he was talking about the immune system and getting the immune system on board with radiation. So I guess my theory, I guess, I'm, I'm not a doctor, but I can make a theory, is maybe radiation first and then some kind of immunotherapy. I mean, I just, I just would love to see some of this science continue, and I love that everybody is also very eager to see it continue to develop. So thank you, guys. Let's go ahead and turn it over to Lucy Innes. Thank you, doctor. Yeah, I mean, that's actually a really good point, and I'm actually going to touch on that a little bit um, during these slides. I do want to point out that it's the end of the day. We've all been getting a lot of science. I know probably some of you are a little bit scienced out. I know I am a little bit scienced out, so let's all bear with each other for... Uh, I'm trying to make this as, as fun as possible. <laughs> um, so if you haven't met me yet, I'm Lucy Innes. I started my PhD at Weill Cornell Medicine two years ago, and I got a uveal melanoma diagnosis last year. Um, and I've really been focusing my research on studying uveal melanoma, and especially from a very uh, uh, immunological standpoint. So I'm really studying the immune microenvironment. So I am super excited about immunotherapies. Um, and I wanted to give an opportunity to go under the hood a little bit and see, you know, we hear all about these, these trials and you kind of hear all the numbers, but what is sort of the thought process that goes into um, coming up with the idea for a clinical trial and, and the rationale, like, why are we so excited about these immunotherapies? Um, and a little roadmap. First, I'm going to talk about what is immunotherapy and why are we excited about it. I'm going to talk about um, a, a new immune checkpoint inhibitor that I actually really briefly and kind of hand wavy um, brought up in the uh, pharma panel. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about a cool dendritic cell vaccine. Um, and all these are, these I picked out because I think they're a really cool um, example of picking some, a really uveal melanoma specific approach. Um, and, and that's what I think you can do with immunotherapies is you can really 
be really specific towards this disease. Um, and I'll walk you through that. So what is immunotherapy? And, and actually, people have touched on this a little bit already. Um, the idea of immunotherapy is using your immune system to attack the cancer. So traditional therapies, such as radiation and chemotherapy, it attacks you know, more cancer cells, but also a decent amount of, of healthy cells. Whereas when you can get your immune system to attack the cancer, like imagine when you get a virus and your immune system attacks all the cells that are, that are being infected by this virus. They're not just killing all the cells around it either. They're, it's really, really targeted and specific. And so that's the idea behind immunotherapies. But I do want to point out that there's some exciting new, like, just fully chemotherapy drugs that are changing this idea. They're, they actually have really low side effects. Um, so I don't want to scare anyone away from chemotherapy. Um, it's really just kind of like my bias. I'm really excited about immunotherapies. So first I'm going to talk a bit about immune checkpoint inhibitors. And the way these work is there's killer T cells. And these are kind of the main fighting force against cancer in, in a lot of cancers. And when they've been fighting for a prolonged period of time, they will wind up getting exhausted. <laughs> and this is characterized by them having these little markers sticking out the side of them. And they're... Um, and they basically indicate that it's an exhausted T cell. It's not fighting anymore, it's sleepy, it's put its sword down. And immune checkpoint inhibitors work by binding onto these little markers, and it actually is able to revive the T cell and get it back to fighting order. The big question is, okay, these have worked really well for cutaneous melanoma. Why have they not worked hardly at all for uveal melanoma. And there's a number of reasons, and I'm going to talk a little bit about one of them. So, and I'm going to walk you through the science here a little bit. Um, this is from a, a really fun paper. Here is an example of so what a T cell looks like when it has, you know, one of these three possible, there's more, more possible um, exhaustion markers, but here's the three that they looked at. So there's PD-1, and they've tried immune checkpoint inhibitors against that in uveal melanoma, and it didn't do very much. There's CTLA-4, and again, that's been tried in uveal melanoma, and it didn't really work that well. And then there's LAG-3, and that ha they haven't tried any immune checkpoint inhibitors against that yet, and I'll show you why it might be a really good idea to do so. So here's an image of a, bunch of, of a uveal melanoma sample, and everything that's green in there is a T cell. I've made a little box underneath, which is sort of what is going on in my, inside my head. This is what I imagined in that photo. And it's little cartoons of T cells. So then this, this research group stained for PD-1 markers. So that's the little blue arrow sticking off. That's the exhaustion marker, PD-1. And anywhere that lights up blue, that's being expressed on these T cells. I frankly can't even see anything from here. If you look really close, there's maybe a couple. So that makes me think that, okay, a couple of these T cells might have this exhaustion marker on them. And then they stain for CTLA-4, that yellow marker you see all the way on, on the T cell on the left. Again, could almost just be dust on your screen, how little of this is showing up on, the, on these T cells. Um, so that makes me think, okay, maybe a couple of these, of these T cells have CTLA-4. And then they looked at lag three. And that just lit up like a Christmas tree. <laughs> um, and so in my mind, this is what that would look like, is maybe all of these T cells are expressing this immune checkpoint inhibitor. Um, and so that what the, the takeaway from this is that, you know, okay, maybe it's not that immune checkpoint inhibitors don't work against this, against this. It could be that we're just targeting the wrong exhaustion markers. And you know, one important thing is to say is this is one study. You know, this, this could be sort of some bias. This could be, you know, a, a sampling bias. Maybe um, there, there's so many reasons why this isn't necessarily like, oh, for sure it'll work then. Um, but it's exciting. It's an example of how we, we use this research and look under the hood to see what are other potentially, you know, uveal melanoma-specific immunotherapies we can use. And there's a, um, 
really awesome group. So that, that paper came from Dr. William Harver's lab, and him and Dr. Jose Lutsky are, are conducting a clinical trial um, using a LAG3 inhibitor as well as a PD-1 inhibitor. So next I want to talk about the dendritic cell vaccine. And this is actually totally touching on the idea of the, the self-vaccination. Um, so how dendritic, cell, dendritic cells work in the body is that when they come across a site of infection or a place where you know, there's been a battle between you know, uh, like, like cells or maybe some viral debris, some bacterial cell debris, they'll suck all that up and they'll stick on the outside of their cells. And then when they come across the immune system, and that's killer T cells, that's also part of the innate immune system, so they're gonna show this to natural killer cells and macrophages, and that gets the whole immune system on hot alert for these markers. And what's really neat is that we can then use this system to hack the, the biology to then start trying to attack that tumor. And it's, it's actually believed when, when, when we get the sort of self-vaccination uh, from from uh, radiation, that's actually dendritic cells picking up the, um, the tumor markers, and, and that's what's sort of causing the uh, self-vaccination. And so they're trying to do this sort of, you know, in a, in a directed fashion, where they take dendritic cells from the patient, they then take the tumor from the patient and, and crush it up to get all those markers. They teach the dendritic cell about these markers, and so it will then present it on the surface of, of the dendritic cell. And then when they deliver it back into the patient, you can see back there on the left, it's going to be showing all these tumor-specific markers to the killer T cells, to the innate immune system, and that can cause a whole, you know, a whole scale immune response against this disease. And this is still in early stages. They haven't found it to be super effective yet. You know, there's been a couple trials using dendritic cell vaccines, but what they have found is that it's more effective in these sort of colder tumors, the tumors that don't have a lot of you know, in, in, innate immunogenicity. Um, and so that's why it's a really exciting uh, trial to do for uveal melanoma. And I want to bring up Dr. Ralph Steinman, who, who actually discovered the dendritic cell uh, way, decades ago, and he w uh, developed pancreatic cancer in, in 2008. And uh, actually tried a bunch of kind of experimental uh, dendritic cell vaccine treatments, and it, it did prolong his life. For, or you know, He lived longer than, than the expect, expectant uh, lifespan, and he's a bit of a personal hero of mine. Um, and what's great is he, he actually did know the, the folks who are conducting the dendritic cell vaccine clinical trial for uveal melanoma. Um, and so briefly, I'm just going to touch on the two ongoing clinical trials that they're facilitating. First is one that's sort of adjuvant treatment to prevent metastasis, where they design a dendritic cell vaccine from the eye tumor. Um, and that's like a nine-year-long trial, right? Because it can take so long for metastasis to occur. And that's ending either this year or next year. And then the second trial is actually making a dendritic cell vaccine from the metastatic tumor. Um, and so this is more designed to treat metastasis once it's already occurred. Um, and this is a four-year-long trial that is also ending pretty soon. And um, I had the opportunity to meet them. They're a really, really lovely group of people. Um, and I you know, think it's, I, I'm just really excited about all these new approaches. I'm, you know, it's, it's hard as a patient and as a scientist not to get your hopes up too much. And it, cause it's, I think the idea is you really just have to be, you know, tentatively optimistic because most science fails, you know, it's, what was the, the comment about research? It's called the research because you have to keep repeating yourself. Um, and so for me, looking at these, it's, it's exciting. It's a, it's a step. And I'm trying to stay tentatively optimistic. Um, and so the key takeaway here is that um, a lot of this new research in immunotherapies is really finding new targets specific to uveal melanoma. Um, and brand new approaches that activate the whole immune system, and that you know, even you know, you know interacting with um, the people I've mentioned in this in this uh, show, as well as having the opportunity to interact with all the pharma people here, um, I'm just so blown away by how much the community and the the pharma community is, is cares about this disease and are working on a cure. So thank you. Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you. All right, so.
I guess you guys are playing musical chairs. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to go ahead and bring up Dr. Breckbill's slides, and she's going to talk a little bit more about just coping with the news of metastatic disease. So Yes. Um, I'm going to introduce myself again in case there's new people in the room or online. I'm Dr. Julia Breckfield. I'm a clinical psychologist with UW. I work at Fred Hutch in our diabetes clinic here and really focus on helping patients live their best life with chronic or serious diseases. Um, my passion is definitely metastatic cancer and CNS cancers. Okay, so having a little bit more data um, than my previous talk about what does depression and anxiety look like when patients report symptoms to their oncologist or someone like a primary care doctor or a social worker or someone like me? How does it compare? What's out there? The measures that we use are symptom screeners, the PHQ-9 for depression, GAD-7 for anxiety. Some of you probably have taken this in your primary care offices or at your cancer center. They're very common. In general population non-oncology, the percentage is fairly low, less than 15%. In general oncology, it ranges from 20 to 40. In head, neck, CNS cancers, it's much higher. The trick, though, is um, a lot of the questions on there are difficulty concentrating, difficulty sleeping, changes in appetite, worry. Of course you're worried there's cancer. Like, it's not very sensitive measure. So in another study that I ran a few years back, we took patients with CNS cancer, primarily brain tumor, and we used fancy statistics, a cluster analysis, to see where do their scores best fit using four different measures. So two measures of death distress, anxiety about death, sadness or depression about death. Um, there's also death obsession. It's not as prevalent of a construct we learned in this study. Um, and then the two symptom screeners for depression and anxiety that I mentioned. It looks like there's a lot in this first cluster, but we wanna pay attention to the y-axis. It's actually a z-score, meaning how far, much do they deviate from the average. So in cluster one, it's actually not the number of people. There's actually only six people, I think, in that cluster. I would have to look in my notes on the slide. Um, but those six people are having a really hard time. The group that has the most people in it is this last cluster, existential distress. That is, um, I want to say, like two-thirds, 60 patients. Um, the sample size is very small because not many people have CNS cancer and want to participate in a study sometimes because uh, they have so much going on. Um, and the two measures that they did score a little high on were actually just death anxiety, death depression, not true depression and anxiety. So that's what I'm going to be focusing more on today is the idea of existential distress. Um, existential distress is when we have a lot of questions about our purpose, the meaning of life, what our beliefs are, when the idea of life and suffering kind of comes to the forefront. The, again, a normal construct, like I mentioned earlier, but when you have those scans, when there's a pinpoint on a lung or a liver and there's this lag time where you have to do something with some information, but there's not an action in place, there's not enough to biopsy, we're just waiting, you're living between scans. As that next scan is approaching, you have all these things bubbling up. Um, sometimes it's existential distress, not true anxiety or depression. It's just what is this data going to mean? What are we going to do next? So the idea of existentialism is really dynamic. It has a really fluid, um, nonlinear trajectory. It can happen at the time of diagnosis, um, ups and downs during treatment and changes in your body and roles and identity it can happen at any time. Um, everyone experiences existential distress. Sometimes I think of when you're graduating high school and you don't know what's going to happen next in your life. That sometimes is a type of existential distress. Um, sometimes just fear of death, like a phobia of death, can be a type. But in a setting with cancer treatment or new imaging that shows a metastasis, that can come up to the forefront much more quickly. Thinking about patients and caregivers, too, as I'm presenting today, it's going to look a little different for a caregiver than a patient. 
but it's still very common. Both people in that dynamic are going to have that existential distress. Providers have it, loved ones have it, and the patient has it. But what we're distressed about is going to be different. And where we find comfort and encouragement with that existential distress is also going to be different. Um, for some people, being really accepting, pragmatic view, it's probably more my style. I love talking about it. Um, some people find comfort and faith in how they define purpose and meaning and why we're here on this planet hurtling through the cosmos. Um, there is a lot of really good research showing that having higher levels of existential well-being, kind of that confidence in our purpose and our meaning, is better for our anxiety and our stress. Um, people report better quality of life. They actually report fewer health symptoms as well, like sleeping better, less pain, um, less GI symptoms. There are some risk factors for having higher existential distress, not being able to have conversations to talk about this topic. I'm really proud of you all for being here, despite probably some discomfort in talking about this. Um, it can also be a hyper-awareness, kind of like a rumination. If our brain is stuck on thinking about what's going to happen next, that can kind of amplify. It's like, don't think about a pink elephant. All you're going to think about is that pink elephant now and how cute it is. And it's, I'm thinking of the car wash logo in Seattle, um, the old landmark. Some of you might know that. Um, Having a reduced sense of control and autonomy, I really appreciate hearing all of our oncologists from Fred Hutch speaking about how they include the patient and personal preferences and collaborative decision making because that's going to be really protective against existential distress, feeling like you have control and agency over your body when sometimes cancer can feel like it's taking from you. Um, and then ha not having space to have philosophical conversations. So being able to talk really honestly about that surrealism of why are we here? I've never had a, I've never been challenged to think about it until now when I'm faced with the option that I will not be here. So some really practical and emotional. Some people are like problem solving focused coping style like I talked about earlier. Some are processing, let's talk about it, let's feel it through. If you're more of a, um, problem-solving person, you want to have a coping strategy, I really encourage building a mindfulness practice. This can look a lot of different ways, um, and it's different for everyone. The whole intention of it is focusing on the present, not worrying about what's coming next, but making sure we're here and now. That can look like a mindful walk where you're taking in with all your senses, the temperature, the air, the sounds, your neighbor's gardens, the weather. Um, sometimes it's listening to different guided relaxations. These are two free resources that I recommend. They're really good quality. I do like to warn that Insight Timer will try to get you to pay, but you don't need to. It's still very good. And I recently learned that like things like Netflix has um, Headspace, I think, on it. HBO has like calm travel ones. It's gotten really popular and really accessible nowadays. Um, I think also making sure and reminding yourself of your legacy. Um, what are you leaving behind? That can be very tangible. We always hear about people like leaving cards and letters, but it can also be... Um, your legacy professionally. It can be how you've raised people and help people grow. Um, it can be non-tangible as well. So reminding yourself that it's not for nothing. Um, and then when you are relaxed here in the present moment, engaging in meaningful activities and relationships. So like coming to events like this, this is really important and meaningful for us as providers, but for you as well. Other ways are creative expression of your emotions. So be it art or writing or journaling or music. It can even just be listening to it, um, getting into a book series. Um, it could be another way of getting in touch with our feelings if we don't want to talk about it and verbalize it. I've like As I was making this slide, I like realized I was like, I'm talking a lot about like work on your meaning, find your meaning, and I'm not really telling you how to do that. Um, Sometimes it's something we can just feel instinctually, but it's hard to communicate. Um, 
So thinking of what are the spaces where you feel the least judgment and the most confident? Or um, is it like thinking about the present more than the future? When do you notice cancer kind of fades to the background and going and trying to find more of those opportunities. I'm a big fan of the values card story. I realize it's a link, but again, I'm happy to share my slides. You can also Google it and it's uh, one of the first two links, they're free. Um, and then it's this idea of sorting cards that have all these words on it of important, not important, and you narrow it down to your top five and then you think of ways to make sure you're doing activities that align with those values instead of thinking about cancer. I also strongly encourage you, tell your oncologist about their, your hobbies. It's probably a better metric than weight in labs about how you're doing. We wanna know, what are you up to? How's your garden doing? How's your family doing? How was that trip? That way we're able to track how you've been feeling, not just physically, but emotionally coping as well. The other piece, um, I, I'm also, as I was making this, I was like, wow, this, I'm like thinking about toxic positivity here. Like, am I preaching this? No, I don't want to be preaching toxic positivity. That's just be mindful. It's all okay. It is really normal to vacillate. This is the dual process model of grief. It is really normal to be going through the loss orientation when you are waiting between scans or you're waiting to see when you can do a biopsy, or waiting to see when the next treatment's available. But we don't want to spend the whole time on the left side of the figure in that loss-oriented process. It's sometimes okay to think about like restoration in a way of denying and avoiding grief. It sounds bad, but it's actually really good. You cannot grieve 24-7. You're just gonna feel awful. So sometimes ignoring it intentionally is the best for some. Okay, um, Dr. Hall talked a little bit about goals of care. Um, I was reading one of the books I'll mention at the end and it really stood out to me that most patients I have known have told me that they can think of worse fates than dying from cancer. And it's up to doctors and patients and families to talk about where is that line? What would be worse? I've talked about it with my family and my partner. We're in the medical field, mostly our family, so it's again, it's like dinner conversation for us, but it's not normal for everyone to talk about these things. Um, encourage you to talk to palliative care. I spent a lot of time with my patients demystifying palliative care, that thinking of what the word means to make things palatable, bearable. It's really focused on symptom management. We don't want you nauseous. We don't want you in pain. We want you having quality of life, not just longevity. It's always good to have a trusted relationship with someone, even if you just meet with them once or you continue following up with them every few months as you get your scan results. Um, other definitions of goals of care are like, I don't wanna be in a hospital, nope. I want to avoid the ER. That can be a goal of care, and it's something you want to tell your oncologist. Sometimes I've had adults be like, I just want privacy. I don't want my kids in the medical record. I'll tell people I don't want it on social media. I just want to be treated as normal as possible. Um, so it's not always a medical quality of care. Sometimes it is just to feel like you have your own body, you have your own autonomy and control and choice. Um, if you are kind of curious about like the logistics of planning to have metastatic disease, end of life care, the Go Wish game, it's not a fun game. It's like it's like the values card sort, but it's very specific acts of medical care that you may or may not want, or the kinds of support you may or may not want um, at end of life with family and caregivers. Okay. I don't think this is a huge issue with our oncologists here, but I don't wanna assume all oncologists are as wonderful <laughs> as folks. Sometimes I tell my patients I am a double agent. I work within oncology to be a referee between patients and oncologists. So I wanna break this conspiracy of silence um, about talking about end of life because it's a very real and leg legitimate fear that you may have. Um, and so really challenging your providers. I want a realistic picture so I can plan. When you know you're ready for that data, 
I want you to feel like you can say that to your providers. Sometimes the palliative care doctor might be able to answer this better. It's also okay to say, I did not understand that. You need to translate, speak non-medical to me. Like, tell me as if I was a high schooler. Like, how would you explain this? Draw me a picture. Whatever your learning style is, ask for it. Um, always slow the train down. Pause. There is never a rush. It feels like you're about to jump off a cliff. We don't make our best decisions when we are in an intense emotional state. Um, I have patients who learn the hard way not to check their like my chart medical record without a follow-up oncology appointment. And they just say, I'm just not gonna even look at it. Others will tell their oncologist, I'll send you a message when I make a decision or I'll schedule another appointment. And they leave just with a ton of information and just sit on it. So don't rush to make a decision just to alleviate the, the discomfort. Um, a lot of people just wanna know how much time do I have left? Think of other questions that are important to you to challenge your oncologist or a palliative care doctor. If you're worried about how it will feel at end of life, ask or ask peers of how do people die from uh, like uvular melanoma or other metastases or other cancers? How is it different? Every cancer is very different. Um, what is it like to transition to palliative care or tr transition to comfort care or transition to hospice care? It can be really jarring. Again, it's that jumping off a cliff. You wanna know what's gonna happen before you, you jump out of the plane and go skydiving, right? Like who's gonna be there to catch you? Some oncologists can't still be your doctor. It's good to know that. Sometimes providers can still follow you in hospice. Some will be your palliative and your oncologist. It just depends on who they are and where you're getting treatment. But it's good to know these things of what would happen. Okay, so again, thinking of psychotherapy, some people feel like they have this down pat, they know what they want, they know what they don't want. Sometimes they need that space to learn about themselves and get that feedback and learn how to see things from other perspectives because they don't wanna talk with peers or loved ones about it. Um, Victor Frankel is the author of the book I mentioned in my last talk, Man's Search for Meaning. He is um, a survivor of concentration camps, and his book is really impactful about what we can bear, that we don't have a ton of control over what situations or conditions or challenges may face us, but we do have a choice of how we face that challenge and how we work on ourselves to be ready to face challenges. So there are a couple different evidence-based modalities for people who have metastatic disease or other end-of-life conditions. So one is meaning-centered psychotherapy, the other is managing cancer and living meaningfully. Um, most cancer centers do the first, is what I've realized. The second one is not quite as common, but they're both very similar. Okay, Whew. So. Um, it's kind of like in the name, we're focusing on meaning. It's a more structured modality, structured sessions, there's workbooks, there's activities. If you're someone who wants to be held accountable, this is probably a really good modality for you. Um, I like the idea of, this is something I even practice nowadays, of moving away from doing. Am I just doing a job? Am I just doing this activity? Am I just doing the laundry and chopping the veggies? Or am I being myself? Am I doing things that make me feel alive? Um, and again, breaking that conspiracy of silence or taboo of detoxifying the idea of death. And then the other one is the calm therapy. Um, this one is a little bit more semi-structured, more fluid. It can be really more flexible depending on what's going on. If there are more like fast-moving parts, I really like this modality because it incorporates bringing loved ones to sessions and providing um, support to the dyad as dyadic relationships do change at different points in your cancer journey treatment. Um, 
because sometimes it can feel like you're moving towards caregiver patient dynamic and you just want to be partners or you just want to be mother daughter or siblings it's hard to restore the like more uh, important relationships we can feel like relationships become really medical and so i really like this to help not just with those kind of relationships but also help me manage the medical relationship changes in ourself um, I remember going to the panel of patients and just really noticing this commonality that a lot of us like to take care of other people and it can feel really weird when we're the ones being taken care of then. Like I'm the worst patient when I get sick. Like most providers, we're not great patients because we like to take care of others. And when I have to be taken care of, I'm just like really frustrated. <laughs> um, and we talked a lot about meaning and purpose today. I talked about this in my other slide. Um, I just think I want to touch on this quote because I forgot to put in the other one, that a skilled woodworker doesn't avoid making mistakes, that it's okay if bad things happen. She knows how to fix them, compensate, and to embrace them. It doesn't throw off the project. We keep going. And then recommended reading. These are all tear jerkers. I'm going to warn you, especially the first one. Um, Yalom is a existential psychotherapist. My theoretical orientation, adore him. Him and his wife are older. Um, they took turns writing chapters in this book. It is a heart wrencher um, about what it was like for them to age old together. And they're both like very wonderful writers um, and how his wife died of cancer and how he coped with it. So it really gives that dual perspective of two people in a relationship handling this together. Man's Search for Meaning is great for everyone, patients and caregivers, and people who don't have cancer, give it to your friends. Um, if you want something that's a little bit more practical, less emotional, but still a lot of information, but not too medical, I really love The Art of Dying Well. I quoted it a little bit in this presentation. And then Being Mortal is more of a... Um, nonfiction book about how the medical system handles caring for people with complex chronic disease and end-of-life care um, in the U.S. specifically. Same resources as before in case you missed them last time. And then my contact, please reach out. This is my dog, Loki. He's adorable. I love him. I miss him. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, guys. Let's give them a round of applause. Okay, so I know my camera guy is not going to love me for this, but I'm sorry. Um, we had a couple of questions that came in, and if it's okay with you guys, I want to give the doctors a chance to answer a couple of these. Um, and if you guys have questions, um, please feel free to write those down. We'll come and collect them. Uh, but we probably have, I'm going to say max, five to ten minutes. So we're going to do what we can to get to the ones that we have. But I wanted to just, uh, as I pose that first question, um, I'm going to hand the mic. Actually, can you hand me an extra mic? You guys get to see me juggle all the mics. Okay, so Dr. Bhatti, I'm going to give you one of these. Thank you. And feel free, if you want to come to the stage, you're welcome to. Um, okay, so there was one question a little bit further back that just said, I haven't heard you mention scans every three months, only every six months. There's a small percentage of patients who need them every three months or have them. Maybe not a small percentage, but a number of patients who have them every three months. Um, what type of patient, I guess this is both Dr. Bhatia and Dr. Hall, would be eligible, in your opinion, for that three-month scan? Because I, I think uh, this is a preference. for. So I think this is, you know, there's always, I think... Oncologists in oncology is a little more flexible than most people may assume. So I think, you know, maybe it's someone where, from Dr. Bhatia's talk, we'd be thinking about six months, a higher risk patient. But there's someone who gets a lot of reassurance out of scans and doesn't have a lot of anxiety. So the downside of doing it more often, and maybe they have great insurance and it doesn't really, and they don't mind going in the tube, who's had an MRI? Some people, it doesn't bother them. Some people really don't like getting an MRI. So, you know, it, it's just these, these factors that just, you know. So is it wrong? No. Is it the most common way? Probably not. Um, you know, I, so I think it would probably be someone who's higher risk, who, whose style is one that that's really helpful for them. And, 
as has been said, the nice thing about MRI is there's no radiation. So it's, it's time and money, but it's not necessarily harmful to have more. Okay. Often. Dr. Bhatia? Yeah, I, I think the way I think about it is, is it needed? Um, why do we need it? So if, if a patient's disease is potentially very aggressive, where it's likely to blossom in a very rip-roaring manner in a period of three months, it would make sense to do scans three months. The good, fortunate part about this disease is it can stay dormant. It is not that super aggressive. Many a times when we catch it, or almost pretty much every time, the tumors are very small on the MRIs. So I don't feel we gain that much by doing it every three months. And I certainly, this is a point that I want to kind of drive uh, really hard is, do not feel anxious about not getting scans every three months. For this disease, the pace at which it comes and grows, it's much slower than many other more aggressive cancers. So I actually, I have not had, I've been using every six month strategy for years, and I've not had a single patient where I regretted, oh, I wish I had done this every three months. Okay. And I want people to get confidence from that. So I guess I think what I'm, what I'm hearing from this patient's question, which I think actually came in from online, so I don't even know if they're for sure listening, is probably just that based, maybe not across the board everywhere, but many of the oncologists that we've heard from previously in previous seminars, I think that they tend to focus on um, those scans following the general risk factors of prognostication from the Castle Biosciences test. So when you have a class two diagnosis, there's many oncologists on the East Coast that they advocate for every three months for that first two to five years. And that's based on their clinical experience. That's based on their patient preferences. Um, what I'm, I guess what I'm hearing is that there's, there's maybe some grounds to use that prognostication test for insurance purposes to get approval for that every three months if you want it, if your doctor thinks it's necessary or helpful to you. But what I'm hearing from Dr. Bhatia and Dr. Hall is it's maybe not clinically absolutely necessary. It's it's not necessarily going to change the outcome of if they find it, you know, at the three-month mark versus if they find it at the six-month mark of that MRI. Um, because the reality is, like you said, it's it's being found much sooner if it is found, and it's being found much smaller, and the growth rate is much slower at that first point. And so it's just kind of that, that advancement in imaging has made it a lot more kind of open-ended there. I would just add that the the actual National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines are written in a very broad way with very large ranges. And I think that that's done to allow some tailoring. I mean, it's done to allow tailoring and a personalized plan between your oncologist and your and the patient. And um, the other thing that three months sometimes comes up is people who are on clinical trials of adjuvant treatment that might be mandated by the trial to be every three months. It's a little different scenario. That's an experiment. There's a more of a structured follow-up that everyone's being followed the same way. So there's a, it's a slight difference in that scenario as well. Okay. Um, this is another kind of similar to surveillance question. This one just talks about liver numbers and the reference to checking liver function. Maybe say you make it to that 10-year mark, and then we're checking the blood test, the liver function. Um, this patient's understanding is that liver numbers are not typically elevated until the liver burden of like tumors in the liver is high. So, um, is, do you guys you know agree? Do you both, Dr. Hall, Dr. Bhatia, do you both agree that monitoring the liver levels can be effective at a certain point, or you know maybe is there something else about those liver numbers that you're looking at? Yeah. Well, great questions. Um, I, I think we're, uh, we're making you think well, real hard. <laughs> Um, the, the liver function testing, again, is, uh, it, it has limitations. So, and we acknowledge those limitations, and that's why we're not just relying on just getting the LFTs done. Uh, but I think in the happy situation, when we know that a patient is more likely to be in that lower risk category, many years down the line, we have subjected them to multiple scans over the years, at some point we kind of face that question should we keep doing this for the rest of our lives or should we actually, you know, ac accept that, yes, there is still a little bit of chance of the cancer coming back, but the chance is much decreased as compared to what it was possibly at the diagnosis. So it's kind of a low intensity surveillance option in a very good risk situation. Um, and uh, that's kind of how I think about it. Uh, but there's no... No, no real absolute, uh, you know, way, one way of doing things here. 
Um, this is kind of just a logistical question. You guys have talked a lot about scans and um, using those scans as information. When you are first diagnosed, to you, I think it was Dr. Stacy. I think you mentioned having like base, like baseline scans. That typically there's some scanning done of you know the liver, the lungs, at the time of the eye diagnosis. Is that pretty true across the board? I believe that's pretty true across the board, though it's probably done differently in different centers. So okay. here in Seattle, that those initial scans are ordered by myself and so that they are on file for when they get to Dr. Bhatia and Dr. Hall. Um, in many other places, it would not be that way. They might just refer them immediately to, to an oncologist. Okay. So then my main question there then is when you have scans, right, whether it's every three months, six months, every year, those say you were diagnosed in 2015. Are your baseline scans what radiologists should be using to determine has something changed? Like those first diagnosis scans, or do they compare and is it adequate to compare the, oh, I had a scan six months ago, can I compare those two? Yeah, so I, th I think, yeah, again, great questions. Um, <laughs> when Dr. Stacy orders a test for initial diagnosis, he's just wanting to make sure that there's no clear disease in the liver, so we, we, we can then prioritize that rather than focusing on the eye. Uh, most of the times he gets a CT scan of chest, abdomen, pelvis because it's quick to get it, uh, easier scheduling and all that. And most of our patients come with that baseline uh, come with that baseline to us. And when we see them in the clinic, we actually establish a new baseline by doing an MRI. And once that MRI is done, that is kind of our baseline for all the future scans. So the first scan change, I guess, uh, modality change establishes a new baseline for that patient. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. All right, we're going to switch gears over here. And so let's chat about what if we have that small metastatic discovery, right? Where you guys talked about maybe there's a three millimeter spot. Maybe there's a hard to biopsy spot. How would you, Dr. Breckbill, suggest that a patient go about coping with that kind of waiting period where you don't get immediate treatment, you're not siphoned off to the first center and you're not slated for a per, you know, clinical trial. You're just kind of stuck. <laughs> yeah, that's grueling. I feel like... I didn't think that was question was going to be for me. So Sorry. I'm wondering if my current shock is a little similar. Of oh. You're just like, whoa. Oh, she's been blindsided. <laughs> just, well, yeah, you're feeling blindsided. I am not, pers not personal. Um, I just wasn't prepared. I just wanted to make sure you, like, physically had the reaction first. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. The empathy is there. Um, it depends on what helps you. Do you um, want to talk about it? Who do you want to talk about it? I don't think... There is one size fits all of I'm going to say as a doctor, you have to do this. It's really thinking, what helped you when you were initially diagnosed? Because that's another shocker. Or when a big treatment milestone came up and that was a shocker. You had to have surgery or radiation or you had to pick something. How did you cope in the past? What worked for you? Um, or thinking of other challenges. Maybe you are newly diagnosed. Um, when have you been challenged in the past? what other um, work or family things have happened and what got you through those. Um, sometimes it is therapy. Sometimes it is talking to maybe your cancer center has social workers, not psychologists or psychiatrists. Um, sometimes it's a primary care office actually has pretty good um, mental health resources in it as well. So. I love that. Yeah. And honestly, I guess most of you guys weren't here yesterday, but those of you who were, this is pulling from that, okay, what have I already done? How far have I already come? Pulling from those prior experiences to use that to cope. Um, let's switch gears back to the medical side. I saw Dr. Hall grab the mic. So I guess, yeah, how would you help a patient cope from your side? You know, if you're like, okay, there's a three millimeter spot, we can't biopsy it, we need to wait and see. How do you help reassure that patient? Yeah, it comes up not infrequently, actually, with our very fancy imaging. Um, I think the first is just acknowledge, like, yeah, this is kind of a limbo period. This might end up being something serious, or it might not. And in fact, I've had both situations happen, and they they're both happen frequently enough that it's, it is really hard to say how worried somebody should be about it. Um, and then, not to belabor it, but sometimes that next scan also, same thing. So then you're kind of in this longer limbo. And in that case, I think you can say, well, whatever this is, it is changing very slowly to the point that it's not evolving 
much at all, which is even if it were to be a cancer metastasis, at least it's not behaving aggressively. Um, but it is, it's hard. I mean, it's, you want to know what's going on and what the plan is, and you're in a period where that period of time is stretched out. You don't know. I'm going to add, I'm a psychologist. I like to talk, okay? Um, where sometimes when we have data, we assume the negative, right? That we assume this is bad. Um, if there's nothing to be done, sometimes I remind myself, I don't need to think about it. It's, I don't have a single patient who has ever, ever said, I wish I worried more, or I wish I thought about this more. If your doctors are saying there's nothing to do until your next scan, I would try to probably encourage you, if I was your provider, to also not think about it because there's nothing to be done. So yeah. that is kind of that radical acceptance well, piece. And, and maybe not even not think about it, but just accept the answer you've been given. Even. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. like you said, radical acceptance for sure. Yeah. Okay. Nobody's up behind me. I thought I felt someone behind me. <laughs> it was a little creepy. Okay. Um, uh, this is, I guess, for both Dr. Bhatia and Dr. Hall. Uh, is there a point, post-metastatic diagnosis, that scanning the whole body becomes beneficial, like a PET scan or a full-body MRI, um, when you maybe have seen the liver uh, metastases or maybe lungs or maybe both or maybe only one? Um, there's just a lot of, you know, that, that tends to be, especially, I think, with caregivers, where caregivers come up, well, why haven't you had a whole full-body scan yet? Like, why aren't your doctors doing that? Aren't they neglecting something? So I guess, can you speak to that, you know, with what you know about uveal melanoma? Yeah, I think that at the time that metastasis is confirmed, it is appropriate to look for the whole body to take an accounting of where where there's evidence of cancer because that does often really, it could suggest a certain type of treatment plan. And then, you know, um, if in the case that's most common, if the cancer is exclusively in the liver, it probably makes sense periodically to look at other parts of the body, but maybe not with the same uh, intensity as looking at the liver once that baseline assessment of you know where all the sites were operating, we're okay. concerned about has been made. I think that makes sense. Do you have anything to add, Dr. Bhatia? But can I ask a question? You can. All right. Question for Dr. Ines. <laughs> uh, so uh, you have a very powerful personal story, uh, but I really want to thank you for focusing your efforts on immunotherapy of this disease. Because I truly, passionately believe that if you're going to make a big difference in outcomes, in the future, it is gonna be involving our immune system in some way, and ChemTrack or Tabentafusp is just a start. We have many other trials that are trying to do the same thing right now, so I applaud you for focusing your time on uh, and efforts on that. Uh, my question for you is, you talked a lot about the good guys in the tumor, the good immune soldiers, uh, but then we also know that there are the bad kind of cells which suppress the immune cells, the good ones. Um, and m what is your understanding of uh, the bad guys in there and how, uh, what kind of efforts are going on, I guess, at suppressing the bad guys? Yeah, totally. So definitely, I mean, I think a good person to talk to is Dr. Katz because I think their, their uh, approach is sort of talking, talking about trying to, you know, convert the the bad guys to the good guys, but um, I mean, ultimately the, the main bad guys in the tumor microenvironment are um, M2 macrophages, I believe. Um, and they're, um, essentially what happens is when, like cancer thinks it's healthy tissue and it's crying out like, I'm damaged, come save me. And these macrophages are like, oh, this is healthy tissue. We gotta like go help it and fix it. And so they are usually actually suppressing the rest of the immune system from attacking. Um, and the other side of this is regulatory T cells. Um, and those are also um, sort of saying like, whoa, like slow down on the immune response. We should be, you know, this is actually healthy tissue. like. You know, keep keep it keep everything under wraps, um, and so I think that there's you know be, going to become more and more approaches that are um, instead of focusing just on, on bolstering the good guys, but actually reversing the um, signaling coming from those those bad actors. Um, I'm really excited to see what's going to come from it. 
Awesome. Thank you, guys. Uh, I guess this is kind of, I don't know exactly who would answer this. It might be a kind of a mixture of you, Lucy, as well as Dr. Hall, Dr. Bhatia. Um, if the cancer can spread to the liver through the bloodstream, why can't it be detected earlier by any kind of a special circulating, you guys referenced circulating tumor cell tests. Um, so why haven't we landed there yet? Yeah, I mean, liquid biopsy is, is a relatively new field and it's growing and I think you know I, I, we we're talking about this in the in the pharma uh, panel is that's actually becoming a more gold standard metric um, I I don't know if it shows up before you know if, if uh, circulating tumor DNA would show up in um, in blood samples before it might show up on a scan but those are the things those are questions that are kind of the cutting edge of science right now yeah I love that yeah I think that um I think to go back to what Dr. Bhatia said, that the diagnostic technology advancement is very important, but it, I think it also needs to be very much coupled with better treatment. Um, otherwise, what you have is a test that says you have remaining ocular melanoma, and we can't even see it on a scan. So then you move that limbo stage to even months or years, or maybe even longer than that, if this is going destined to be dormant for a while, um, you even extend that period. So ideally, you'd pair that incredible technological advancement of detecting cancer in the body when even an MRI won't see it, which would be remarkable, with an intervention that then changes the history of the disease. Oh, that's um, such a powerful point. Like that idea that, okay, does the information help us if we can do nothing? And like, you know, or if, if we can't, maybe not do nothing, but if we can't do anything for a while, right, until it manifests somewhere else that we can physically treat with what's available. Or at least a really good understanding of, you know, what is, so let's say that the blood test said positive metastatic ocular melanoma. What is the range of time until we can detect where it is? Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, again, we're talking be about deploying treatments that are, have a lot of side effects, potential toxicity. But, um, you know, if, it's, if the test is positive, but you might not develop an abnormality for five to 10 years on a scan, who knows what we're going to be doing five to 10 years ago? Both the drugs I talked about were not available and approved five to 10 years ago. So they were probably barely in initial studies. So, I mean, I, I think it's, it's a really exciting technology, but needs to be paired with the treatment part. Oh, that's such a powerful point. Well, let's go ahead and give our speakers a round of applause, you guys. Thank you, guys. All right. I guess I need to find my clicker and drop some things down so I don't have too many things in my hand. Um, I just want to applaud you guys again. Like I think Dr. Breckbill said, is just the idea that you're here. And I know we've been through a long day. We've had a lot of, of science-heavy stuff that we've talked about. Um, take care of yourselves the rest of tonight. Tonight, the goal of our dinner is to let you leave behind metastatic disease and the discussion of all the science and all of the ocular melanoma terms that you've just heard. And you can focus on accepting, you know, radical acceptance of, you know, getting used to the idea of death and all of those things. We can do that later. We're not going to do that tonight. Tonight, we're going to just focus on having fun. Um, dress up if you want. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dress up because I like to dress up. Um, but I just want to also applaud you guys for facing this. Um, I, you guys, most of you know I love Harry Potter. So I'm just going to leave this, I guess, with you guys is that fear of a name only increases fear of a thing itself. And so I just want to like draw your guys' attention to the idea that you guys are here facing that thing that, you know, too many patients want to leave unnamed and they want to leave it alone. They want to bury their heads in the sand and not look at it for a while. And that's not to say that we can't do that. Like we, sometimes we need that, right? We got to just ignore it sometimes, but facing it and just empowering yourselves with information, coping strategies, uh, it's all so valuable to you as a patient, and whether you end up needing to use it to manage metastatic diagnosis is irrelevant. It will help you in the rest of your life, too. So um, hoping to end that on kind of just a, a more, just a, I guess, an empowering and a hopeful note for you guys. And I loved, I think it was, it might have been a couple of them who talked about the idea of faith. But for me, faith has evolved not into this idea that everything's going to be okay, right? But it's more of a belief in good to come. Um, even if I don't know all the answers and everything feels uncertain. So I hope you guys can just lean into that faith. Just a couple quick announcements as we end. 
Thank you again to our partner, Delcath. Um, they were one of our sponsors. They have been here, and we're so grateful for them, and hopefully we'll be able to interact with them a little more tonight at the dinner. But they are an interventional oncology company who's focused on the treatment of primary and metastatic liver cancers. At Delcath, they look beyond uh, ordinary, and they strive for excellence in all that they do. And they are grateful, um, and we are grateful for having their contribution here to the seminar. Again, all of our sessions are gonna be recorded. They will be available on the podcast as well as our YouTube channel. Thank you to our Tech Event Pro and uh, their production. They've been recording everything in as high quality as possible. We're super thankful for that. If you haven't yet, please subscribe to our newsletter. This is where we send you updates like how to register for next year's seminar, how to register for different races. So if you haven't yet, screenshot this um, and then take a picture or ask me and I'll send you the link. But subscribe to that newsletter to stay in the know. Uh, we promise we won't spam you too much with emails. Again, plug for the registry. We talked about this yesterday. If you didn't hear yesterday's talk, please go back and listen to that one about how to be part of the registry. And um, don't be me and wait for three years to join in. <laughs> So coming fall 2024, we actually can't specifically announce a location yet, uh, but fall 2024, you can expect we will do this again. We just don't know exactly where, so stay tuned, subscribe to the newsletter, and stay tuned on the podcast and social media for when we announce our next year's seminar. Thank you again to our presenting, camp, uh, presenting spa, sponsor, Castle Biosciences. I've been doing this all day, guys. Um, and we just want to thank them and thank Kat again for the round table you did. And we hope that that was a good experience for the patients who were here. Uh, I think that feeling involved in our own care and feeling involved in the science is one of the most empowering things we can gain as patients. Thank you again to all of our sponsors, Immunocore and IDEA, Aura, Life Sciences, or Trisalis Tris Life Sciences, Delcath, Northwest Eye Design, and Replimune. Thank you again to UW Medicine, Dr. Stacy, for organizing all of today's Track 1 speakers, for Fred Hutch Cancer Center for all of your contributions, and to the OMF Foundation for helping to spread the word about this conference as well. Um, Dr. Stacy, do you mind if I bring you back on stage for a sec? putting him on the spot. Let's give him a round of applause for all of his hard work. Um, I'm going to read this off, but I'm also going to share one thought. Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> um, so I was sitting here listening to uh, the ocularists as they were talking and they said they had this problem and it made me angry. They were talking about how much it costs to get a prosthesis and it makes me angry that it costs so much. It's a problem, frankly, that we have to tackle. And I thought about all of the different entities in this room. We have a lot of different entities. We have pharma, pharmaceutical companies. We have researchers. We have physicians. We have patients. We have patient advocates. We have those who are with the patients, and we have organizers of the meeting. That is a team assembled to solve problems, and we are not a big group, right? We are an orphan disease. We are not a big group, and the physicians can't do it by themselves. The researchers can't do it by themselves. The patients can't do it by themselves. For us to solve these problems, we need a team approach, and I think this is a great representation of the team approach. And so as I was thinking about how do we solve that problem of getting insurance companies to pay for this thing, they pay for it in every other disease. They need to pay for it in this thing. That is a problem that can only be solved by the whole team. We need every one of those people to solve the problem. And I would say the same thing is true about the next steps. I agree with Dr. Bhatia. We need treatments. We need immunotherapy treatments that work. That's a problem that can only be solved by everybody, by donating to research, by being part of um, registries, by the physicians taking care, by the researchers solving problems. So, um, it's a team approach, and I just want to make sure we all recognize that we are all on the same team. It's a small team, but it's a great team, and we're all on the same team. So with that, I'm just going to read this. Special thanks to all those who made this weekend possible. The Acure Insight team, UWI Institute, um, Tech Event Pro Productions, Fred Hutch, the Ocular Melanoma Foundation, our virtual support team, photographer, speakers, all the event sponsors, the Seattle Renaissance Marriott Hotel, and all of you. Good job. You, you filled in the blanks. <laughs> Thank you, guys. We're so glad you're here. Please join us for dinner tonight at 5.30. Take the next couple hours. Go, you know, chill, have a break. Um, and we will see you guys later tonight in the Vision 
ballroom uh, in floor 28. Kevin has given me the yes that I said that correctly. <laughs> All right, reminder, you guys, you guys are thrivers, not just survivors, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>